Welcome again to North Shore Church of Christ. We are, of course, at uh, 326 Julian Street in Waukegan, Illinois. Our phone number for contact is 847-623-9727. That's 623-9727. Uh, <clears throat> we just love to have you in our classes. Uh, I am, I'm appreciative to those who have participated in these classes over the last several weeks, and hopefully you have been enhanced and edified uh, by what thus saith the Lord. To those who are, to those who want to know more about the Lord and their lives and making their lives better, you're at the right place to get that information. And I'm not saying that that uh, I'm so great at this, I just do the best that I can to share with you uh, what you need to know. Not my philosophy, but the facts of what thus saith the Lord. Obviously, <clears throat> we've had several lessons. We've dealt with anxiety, solutions to anxiety, solutions to uh, worry, uh, solutions to suffering, solutions to hopelessness. Those are some of the lessons that <clears throat> we have taught for your middle of week refueling. And uh, I also want to announce to you, I think I announced it in our last lesson, that we do have a 30-lesson Bible course, which you can enroll in. And what happens there, we will send you a lesson one, and then you answer the question, send it back, and we'll give you lesson two. And we'll do that with you to get to give you a trip all the way through the Bible. The best way to study the Bible is... You can read the Bible, and when you get through reading it, you won't know much more than what you did when you started. At least you can stick your chest out and say you read through the Bible. But the best way to study it is on a topical basis, where you take a topic and you exhaust that topic until you have a good handle on it. And this 30-lesson Bible course will give you at least 30 topics, starting with Genesis, going right on through to the book of Revelation. You know, there are 66 books in God's Word. 37 in the Old Testament, and of course, those, uh, the remaining uh, 27 in the, uh, uh, in the New Testament. And when you study the entire 66 books, you will be enhanced by uh, what the Lord expects of you. I do want to say to those uh, that are dealing with sickness, those that are dealing with the trauma of our nation at this time. This is a teaching moment. This is a moment for you to decide to analyze things that are important in your life. And one thing that is important is decision making. Uh, I want to just for a few moments in this class is give you as students a solution to indecision. Uh, you know, many t there are many decisions that we ought to make, but we fall into the trap of indecision. To open up our discussion, let's go to the Old Testament. Remember what I said? The Old Testament is written for our information. It also shares with us uh, concepts of God, how God... Uh, function. Also, it shares with us how things got started, the beginning of things. Uh, as you know, John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, God created the heavens. So the Old Testament is the beginning of events. The New Testament is a conclusion in other words, it is the reconciliation of our lives. It is redemption. It is the salvation. It is Christ being prominent in the New Testament. In fact, Christ is the way that we get to God. Without Christ, no Christ, no God, because they work together as a team. God is the architect. Christ is the contractor. The Holy Spirit is the communicator. They all have their duties, and you can't have one without the other. Now, relative to indecision, the solution to indecision, let us, in the Old Testament, turn to Joshua. Let's start with 
Joshua. Now, you know, Joshua <clears throat> was a great military leader. He assumed the leadership of the Israelites uh, when Moses died. In fact, Moses trained him. He was Moses' understudy. Uh, he did not uh, become uh, awed by the people. He listened to Moses. He listened to God. And when Moses passed on, then Joshua took over the reins. Of course, uh, Joshua uh, was a great man of faith. In fact, Joshua and Caleb were two of the people of the original group that left Egyptian bondage that made it into the promised land. Everybody else, because of indecision, because of disobedience, they were destroyed by God in the wilderness. And only these two men. So let's go to Joshua, great man. In Joshua, in fact, this is just before his death. Uh, Joshua was blessed to live, if I remember correctly, my memory is correct, right around 110 years, but uh, just before his death, in uh, the 24th chapter, in fact, if I'm not mis that's the last chapter of that particular book, look at, begin with verse number 14, and uh, we just want to read a few verses here to get you ready to go. Now get your note paper together, take some notes, and... Uh, Let's see what we can do on the solution to indecision so we can get ourselves connected with the right relationship with the right God. Or in verse 14 of the, of the last chapter of Joshua, now therefore fear the Lord. In other words, that fear there means respect. Uh, we, we, in fact, we did a lesson on uh, uh, solution to uh, fearlessness. Uh, but here... Now, therefore, fear the Lord. That means respect the Lord, listen to the Lord, honor the Lord, stand in awe of the Lord. Fear the Lord and serve him. How do you serve him? In sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods. Notice the gods there. That's little g. Now, I want you to understand, as we teach in this class, I'm going to help you to pick up some clues to help you and aid you in your Bible study. When you see a little G God, that's, speak, that's not the true God. That's the gods that man has. See, many people today have gods other than the true God. Some people, their God might be the sun. But see, why would you worship the sun when it was created by the true God? You want to worship the creator. That's my suggestion to you. And certainly that is God's requirement of you. All right? He said, put away the gods, that's the little G gods, which your fathers served. Many of us are in various religious experiences based upon our parents or our grandparents or what they did. Now, just because they did it does not mean that God is pleased with it. They did what was best for them. Uh, my grandfather had a Model T. And just because he had a Model T does not mean that I should drive a Model T. Uh, I, I, have a, I have something that's a little better than a Model T. I don't have to crank it to start it. I just push a button to start, okay, turn the key to start. So there are things that our beloved family members did, but they did the best that they knew how to do. Uh, but when you learn better, you do better. Now, so Joshua is saying, put away the gods, the little g gods, which your fathers served on the other side of the flood. Uh, that's when, the, you remember Noah? I'm going to bring up something about that in just a moment here. But Noah in the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. See, there's something about us as human beings. We think that we know as much or more than the God who created us. In fact, let, let me back off of that. We many times think that we know more than our parents, okay? Even though our parents maybe have done some things that was not best for us, but still they have some experiences and they 
know some things that we don't know. That's why we have to, as the good book says, as the Bible, the Biblos, the volume, the word of God says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days might be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So in this verse, Joshua goes on to say, uh, uh, in verse 15, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, now that's capital L. Now, if it seems evil unto you to serve the true God, okay? Now, if you want to keep doing what you're doing, uh, you know, if you want to get into that area of optional decision making, see, I want you to understand, the, the Lord doesn't put out a smorgasbord where you can choose what you want to choose and, and, and walk by what you want to walk by. You, you have to take the word in its completeness. You have to do it correctly. As, as one writer said, you know, if you offend the law in one point, you're guilty of all of it. The Lord wants you to take all or nothing. I remember my mother used to say when we were eating at the table, she said, now, eat everything that's on your plate. Be in the clean plate club because food is valuable. All right? So he goes on to say, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, now here's a key phrase, choose you this day whom you will serve. Now, 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 now I want us to, this is what our lesson is about, is we cannot be in the, in the middle of indecision. You can't be hot or you can't be cold for the Lord. You can't be middle. You got to decide, choose this day whom you will serve whether the little g-gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me, Joshua said, now watch Joshua. Joshua says, but, now whenever you see but in the Bible, that's a coordinating conjunction. That's a change of emphasis. But as for me, and, and, and you know, I, I like what Joshua is doing now. First of all, since I'm the, I'm the daddy, I'm the father, I'm going to set the tone. He said, as for me, and, there's another coordinating conjunction, and my house. Now, I don't know about your house, but as for me and my house, we will serve the capital L Lord. All right? You like that? Okay, just jot that verse, underline that verse right quick. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. So God doesn't want us to do that. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us. Now listen there, the people are now, they are recanting and remembering what the true God has done for them. Brought us up out of our, uh, up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You remember under old Pharaoh, how Pharaoh treated them, making bricks without straw and not feeding them properly, giving them the worst of conditions. The house of bondage, which did those great signs in our sight. God did some great signs in our sight. What is the great sign? One great sign. Well, you remember when Moses opened the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground? That was a sign. You remember when the death angel passed through Egypt and those who didn't have blood on the doorposts. The death angel killed anybody. The, 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 the male child in that household was killed if they didn't have blood on that doorpost. He says, now the signs that God did, great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites. See, in other words, God, the reason why every one of you that's in this class right now and you're listening to this lesson, you're here because God kept your enemies off of you. You would have been dead a long time ago. I would have been dead a long time ago, but God protected me because God has a purpose for all of us. Okay. So Joshua sets this up, uh, the, the, the solution to indecision. You've got to choose who you're going to serve. Now, uh, 
Good decision making in 2020. This, we're living in 2020. This is 2020. This is June 2020. It's a challenge to make good, substantive, Bible-based decisions. It's a challenge because we're affected by so much stuff. We're affected by the Internet. We're affected by the social network. We are, we are affected by our peers. We are, we are affected by what we heard. We, we hear so much and we see so much and it's difficult to make a solid decision. And so, so the challenges, the choices, the choices we face, we got to make a decision whether we want to lie or tell the truth. That, that's the decision. Am I going to be a liar? Am I going to tell the truth? I hate to say this. I hate to say this. But, but our beloved president, he, he, he just seems to be a liar. Uh, just recently, if I'm not mistaken, Colin Powell, one of those great military men, just said, I, I, I cannot support this man. He is a liar. He just lies all. That's what Colin Powell said. He's a liar. Now, you know, if you, you, I, you know and, and I have to agree with him because uh, that, that is indicated by what I hear. Uh, now, we've got to decide <clears throat> whether we're going to be just are unjust. That, that, that's an indes, indes, in, indecision point. you got to make a decision. We have to decide whether we're going to be honest or dishonest. That, that, that's, that, 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 that's a choice you've got to make. You're in, indecision. Politically, let's talk politics. You've got to decide whether you're going to be a Republican or a Democrat. If you're like my beloved brother, the, the producer of this program, uh, Brother Isom, you know, I, I'm not sure where he stands. He might be, a, he, I guess he's an independent. Maybe that's what he is. But anyway, whatever he is, no, no, I'm not sure what he is. But, but, but I'm, I'm pretty certain he, he makes the right decision in this democracy that we are in, in this democracy, this democracy that we're in, class. Okay, you got to decide, though, whether you're going to be a Republican or a Democrat. you got to decide whether you are you a liberal or con conservative. Now, let, let me share something with you. As, as a matter of fact, because there are some people who are liber liberals and there are some people who are conservatives, Christ came to save them all. Let me show you how, how, how let, me, let, me, let me establish something for you. You remember when Christ fed the 5,000? You all remember that? Uh, he fed 5,000. He gave everybody food stamps. Okay, everybody got food stamps. In other words, everybody was fed. Everybody was full. All right? that, that was liberal. That was liberality. Now, when it was all over, he had the disciples, the apostles, to pick up the scraps. Don't leave the waste. That's conservative. So Christ appealed to the liberals, and he appealed to the conservative. Just because you're a conservative doesn't mean that you're better than a liberal. Because you are liberal doesn't mean that you're better than someone who is conservative. But you've got to decide who you're going to serve as your, cre as your creator in, in the political realm. Facts or fish. Are you going to be a racist? Or are you going to be a reconciler? You're going to put people together or are you going to divide people? In lifestyle, you've got to make a decision in your lifestyle. You, are you going to be a drunk or are you going to be sober? Now, God gave you a sober mind. He wants you to maintain your sobriety. But if you choose to be a drunk, then there's a price to be paid in lifestyle. Are you going to be a hater or a lover? Now, we, we, we've dealt with that on this past uh, uh, Lord's Day on, on Sunday, on the first day of the week. We gave you a lesson on how to love the unlovely. So you got to make a decision whether you're going to love or to hate. You got to make a decision on substance or style. You got to make a decision in lifestyle whether you're going to be married or single. See, don't, don't be single and try to act like you're married, and don't be married and try to act like you're single. Decide which way you want to be, all right? Married or single. I don't, I, I'm not going to get into that right now, but you got to decide. We, we have the virus going on. The virus is going on. You got to decide whether you're going to wear a mask or you're not going to wear a mask. Now, if, if the rules are to wear a mask, you got to make a decision to wear a mask 
or not to wear a mask. You got, you got to decide in lifestyle whether to be foolish or to be wise. In your worship now, in your worship, th this is a real issue, and we all have had time to make some good decisions when it comes to worship. Are you going to worship the Savior? Are you going to worship Satan? Which, which do you choose? You're going to worship heaven? Are you going to worship hell? Are you going to worship God? Are you going to worship no God? That's what Joshua was saying. You going to worship the true God? Or are you going to worship the false little g gods? That's a decision that you have to make. Until we settle this issue of indecision individually, who we will serve, our lives will be what I call the three H's. Listen to me. Write these down. Until you make this decision, your life will be hopeless. And we brought a lesson on being hopeless. Your life will be hopeless. Your life will be helpless. And your life will be haphazard. Let me say those three things again now. Until you make a decision on who you're going to serve, your life will be hopeless. It will be helpless. It will be haphazard with no destination but the cemetery and our Satan. That's what happens. That's what happens. Now, let's study. Uh, I got a little more time here. All right, let's study uh, the heavenly godly decision. All right? I want to get you to that point. Let's focus on the heavenly and the godly decision. All right? If you have, a, I'm sure you have your Bibles handy. Flip over to 1 Kings. Let's turn to 1 Kings in the Bible. In, in, the, in the Old Testament, you have 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It deals with the kings and the uh, great prophets that God had to carry out his business. God has relied upon human beings to carry out his business from the, an earthly standpoint. There is a man in 1 Kings chapter 18 called Elijah. Elijah was a great prophet of God. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, let's go to the 18th chapter of that particular book, and I want to pick up at verse 21. In verse 21, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, it says, And Elijah, now this is the prophet of God. Now, this is the prophet of this is the minister. He's the, in today's vernacular, he is the preacher. He's the minister. Uh, he is the man who delivers the godly messages. And if you deliver a godly message, you better live by the godly message to the best of your ability. All right? So Elijah says in verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people. Now, you notice here it says, he didn't go to some of the people. See, as a minister, let, let me share a word with you. There is the word teach, and then there is the word preach. When you teach, you take the T off, and it have the word each. That means when you're teaching, you're getting information to a special group of individuals as you teach. Now, when you preach, you take the P off, you are attempting to reach the masses. Greater number. Preach, teach. Now, actually, all preaching is teaching, but not all teaching is preaching. Now, sometimes we mix that thing up. See, sometimes we think that because I teach that I can preach. No, you, 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 many times those, that some people are great teachers and terrible preachers. Some are great preachers and terrible teachers. That's just like in, in, in politics. Some are great presidents but they have poor people skills. Some have great people skills, but they are poor presidents. All right, so now Elijah says, uh, 
how long, now watch this now, how long halt ye between two opinions? How, how long are you going to hang out there and, and, and not decide who you're going to obey? It's, it's like in our households, our children. The children have to decide who they're going to obey. And many times it, 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 they have to make that decision because the parents are not together. So the child's got to decide whether I'm going to obey mother or I'm going to obey father. Now what is the child going to do? The child is going to latch on to the one that gives him or her the best result for what they want. If they need the keys to the car, they're going to latch on to the one that's more easy to get the keys to the car. If they need some money, they're going to latch on to the one that will give. In other words, the, the, the kids have to make a decision on who they're going to serve. All right? So Elijah is saying, how long? Now, here's the question now. See, some people will spend a lifetime and make, never make a decision on which God they're going to, to serve. Are they going to serve the true God? That the, the true God can see the virus. The true God can see people who are Asian, black, white, all nationalities working together for justice. The true God saw this coming before it happened. The virus caused this to happen. It's not so much that we all wanted to do it, but the, 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 that sometimes God can take something that's small that we can't even see and cause us all to function like we ought to function. All right? So, so Elijah says now, how long are you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. Now, see, the people had a choice. They could either follow the capital L, Lord, or the capital G, God, or they could follow a false god who was Baal, B-A-A-L. That was a false god that they had in that day and time. You see, some people worship the stars. Some people will worship a tree. Some people will worship money. Some people, they, we worship a lot of earthly things, but there is the true God versus the Baal. He said, now, let, let, let me go back and just read that phrase again in verse 21. Verse 21 is, the, is, a, is an anchor verse. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. In other words, they, all of a sudden now they got silent. Because those people who had been following Baal, remember their fathers and their parents got caught up with Baal. And they were doing what they were doing because of what their parents. Do you know, do you know that most people, most people, are in the religion that they are in, not because they read themselves into it. They are in it because their parents was in it. See, you, you, really to serve the true God, you need to read his word and do what he says. You don't do what your parents say when it comes to serving the Lord, but you do what the Lord says. Okay, now, as, as, as Elijah says, he, he says now, Decide what you're going to do. And they said not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. Now, now notice, notice what he said now. I am your minister. I am your prophet. I am my own man. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, watch this. Baal, the false god, has 450 other ministers. But Elijah is just one man serving a true God. Now, there is, in order to deal with a heavenly, godly decision, number one, we've got to choose a God. The Bible is saying we ought to choose the true God. Now, let me bring up the true God for just a moment. The true God is Jehovah. Jehovah is the true God. His name means self-existent. His name means he's eternal. His name means that he's almighty. 
His name means that he is independent. Jehovah is also Elohim, which means that when you connect to him, you will prevail. Jehovah is Jehovah Jireh. He provides for you. He's Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Banner. So Jehovah, so you got to choose who you're going to serve. Now, through Abraham, who served Elohim, who served the true God, there were lessons of death and resurrection. When, when, when you connect to the true God, you get lessons on death, life, and resurrection when you deal with the true God. But when you deal with Baal or false gods, you get lessons on death, but you don't get lessons on life and resurrection. The true God gives us lessons that encompass all of our existence, now, yesterday, and tomorrow. That's the true God. Through Jacob, through Jacob, we learned, because Jacob worshiped the true God, Elohim. Jacob worshiped the true God. We got lessons of changing lives. In other words, if, stop for just a moment now. Let's talk about Jacob. Jacob is like a lot of us. You know, so I said us. He was deceptive. There are times in our lives that we all are deceptive. Now, Jacob, not only was he deceptive, Jacob, let, let, let me go with another word. Jacob was crooked. Jacob was unfactual. Jacob stole his brother's birthright. Jacob was deceptive. But, you know, the, the true God changed Jacob's life. On one occasion, Jacob was on a way of, of running away, and God stopped him. He wrestled all night. When he woke up, he was walking with a limp. And you know, Jacob walked with that limp the rest of his life. See, a lot of times, God will shake us up, and we'll walk with a limp in our lives that we remember where we used to be. So Jacob brings us the lessons of changing lives. His life was changed. And finally, and when, when Jacob was near the end of his life, he was giving out blessings as he began to serve the true God. And he was giving out blessings to his sons who had had many problems because of his life. But in the change, he turned around and began to bless them. We find that God is seen, this true God, the, the evidence of the true God, the evidence of the true God, is seen in revelation. It is seen in the resurrection. It is seen in restoration. Okay, so the first thing as I have up here on the board is you got to choose God. Choose Jehovah, the true God, if you want to begin to make the right decisions. Now, there, so there's evidence of the true God by Abraham, by Jacob, and by what God has done. And I'm going to share something with you in just a moment. But there's also evidence of a false God. All right? The false God in verse 21, 1 Kings 18 and verse 21, was Baal. Who is Baal? Baal is known as the sun God, S-U-N God. See, sometimes people would rather worship the sun, which they, which they cannot see, which they can see but they can't look at, rather than worship the true God who created the sun. Baal was a god of man that gave man the religious experience and feeling that man could do anything under the sun. Uh, in other words, he's like a god of convenience. He was a god of compromise. He was a god of corruption. That's Baal. Baal was a god of a self-life. It is me or it is mine. Baal was a false god. Baal is with mankind today. When the true God, listen to me closely now, when you dethrone the true God, then you enthrone the false God. 
it's that there's no in between. When you decide that there is no God, there is no heaven, then you enthrone the false God. Now, is that a decision you really want to make? We got to decide whether it's going to be the true God or it's going to be a God like Baal. Now, that's point number one. You got to choose the God. Then we need to prove God. All right? Let's prove God for a moment. All right, now, in order to do that, I'm going to rely upon Elijah to help us out here a little bit. Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 18, he set up a contest. Now, you see, sometimes uh, you have to, the proof is in the pudding uh, in order to really get an answer. He set up a contest. The first part of the contest, there was the Baal sign. Now, if you have, yeah, you got your Bibles now. Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's go down to verse number 23. So now, Baal seems to be awesome with his 450 prophets. See, a lot of times we all get caught up because we, when we see a religious group that has a lot of people and big people, it means that they got everything going on righteously, but it may not necessarily be the true God. See, the, see, see, the true, the true God can work with one person. The true God turned the world around with one person. That was his son, Jesus Christ. He turned the world around when Christ left. Christ turned the world around with just 12 men. They were called apostles. In other words, Christ doesn't have to have a whole lot of men in order to come out on top. All right? Now, let's, let's, let's deal with to prove God now. All right? So now, Elijah got an agreement with the prophets of Baal. Let's have a contest. Let's see if Baal is the, is the God we ought to serve or is it the true God that we ought to serve. All right? In verse number 23, he said, Now, let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, put no fire under. I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And then he says, and now here's the contest. He's laying out the contest. He said, now, and call ye on the name of your little g-gods. In other words, you, when, when you get this all set up on the altar, don't put any fire on the altar now. Just get everything ready. In other words, if you're going to barbecue, you know, lay, lay, lay your meat on the grill. But don't start the fire. Just put the meat on the grill. But don't start the fire. This, this is the contest. All right, in verse 24. Now, and he said, now once you get that all set up, then start calling on the name of your God. And I will call on the name of the Lord, my true God. Now see, see Elijah's saying, you, you 450 prophets, you call on your little G God, and I'm going to call on my big G God. But first, it's your, your, you, you, you can go first. In other words, I don't have to go first. You go first, and then I'll go second. All right. It says, then, and they, and I will call on the name of God in verse 24. And all the people answered, said, well, this is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves, dress it first, in verse 25, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under all right, so they, they, they did that. Now, now watch verse 26. Now, this is quite interesting. In verse 26, and they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. So in other words, they start calling. You know, it's like a lot of people now, they, 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 they decide to do what they want to do. And when they call on their God, they really get no answer. They called, nor, nor any that answered, and they leaped. Now, in fact, not only did they call, they got up on the altar and started shouting and jumping around and hallelujah. You know, sometimes people in, 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 in a worship service, they get into a, a hallelujah type thing. They jump all over the pews, etc. Have you noticed something? Have you noticed something? That the apostles, though they had a baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, they never jumped around and lose control and, and work up a sweat and all of that stuff. They were just cool, calm, 
and collected on the day of Pentecost. They stood up with Peter and they began to deliver the word and the people said, you know, what shall we do? They were pricked in their hearts and, they, and Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and the Lord added them to the church. There was no jumping all over the, 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 the church or all over the Jerusalem uh, scenario where they were sitting at. They, they, they had it all going. They were cool, calm, and collected. All right, let's get back to Elijah now. So they were jumping all on the altar. Now watch verse 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah began to mock them, and he said, now maybe you all not crying loud enough. So holler a little bit louder. Hey! So get a little bit louder. Hey, Terry, hey, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So cry a little louder, for he is a God. Maybe he's talking. Maybe he's on the phone. Uh, so you got to holler a little out. Maybe he's on the, on the social network. Maybe he's texting somebody. Call your God a little bit louder and tell him to answer. And, and so uh, he is talking or he's pursuing or he is in a journey. Maybe, maybe your God is in the car traveling somewhere. You need to holler real loud. Uh, and and, and when, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on no dose. Maybe he took too many aspirins. You know, don't holler for your God, okay? Now, th 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 this, is a, this is a really a teaching lesson. Now, look at verse 28. They cried aloud. Now, now th this is where it gets even worse. They decided to cut themselves after the manner with knives and lances till blood gushed out of them. Now, this is, this is amazing. They cut themselves to, to try to act as though they maybe are the sacrifice. All right? Now, in verse 29, and it came to pass when midday was past, they prophesied unto the time of the offering of evening. So they went, they started in the morning, they went to noon time, then they went to supper time. Still hollering, no answer. Cutting themselves, no answer. See, sometimes we, because we want to worship a false god. The false gods just don't talk. All right, and it says, there was no answer. In verse 30, Elijah said unto all the people, now, now, first of all, in 29, let's finish up 29, that there was neither a voice nor any answer, nor any that, that regarded. So in other words, Elijah gave them the opportunity to test their belief system to see if it would work. Now, let's go to the second uh, part of the contest. All right, this is Elijah's time now. It's time to test out the true God. All right, in verse number 30, Elijah said unto all the people, now here, here ladies and gentlemen, what I want you to do is I want you to come near unto me. Get real close to me now, because I'm, I'm just by myself, I'm just one man. See, see Baal had 450 people, and I just, just by myself. Now, y'all get real close to me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the, he, now he had to go up there and repair the altar, because he doesn't tore the altar up. Jumping on the altar, he had to get all that blood off the altar, get it all cleaned up again, because it's his time now in, in this contest. And so the people came near him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now, watch this. Elijah took 12 stones. Now, why do you think he took 12 stones? The 12 stones symbolize the 12 tribes. See, he's tying himself to the true God. The true God is the one that set up the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, let me, let me, let, let me show you something right quick. Now, you remember Jacob? I said Jacob, he was crooked. He was deceptive. But Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And every time you see Israel, you need to think about Jacob, a man that was changed. And Jacob had 12 sons, that, and each of those sons headed up a tribe. And these are the 12 tribes of Israel. Now let's look at the word Israel, I-S-R-A-E-L. Israel ends in E-L, which is Elohim, and I-R-A, which, is, which, is, which means prevail, to prevail with God. To prevail with Elohim. And anytime you see Israel, Israel prevailed with God. So he took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Okay, now, 
Now watch verse 32. This is, this is Elijah's part of the story. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Now notice something. Elijah didn't put his name on there. Well, you see, I'm the founder of this. No, no. He put the Lord's name in the name of the Lord. See, you can't name the Lord's stuff with names that you want to put on it. See, that's why we refer to the ark as Noah's ark, because Noah was the builder of the ark. Let's go over to the church now. Who built the church? Christ said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church is named after the builder. Christ is the builder. You can't just put any name on there that you want to. As a matter of fact, my name happens to be Terry Atwater. That was a name. That, that, that's, that's my name. Yeah, that's the name that's given to me. I, I, you, you can't just take my name. Uh, you know, I have my name and you have your name. And Christ has his name. I can't put my name on what Christ built. I can't put, Elijah couldn't put his name on what God is doing. So what does it say? In the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar. So now Elijah did. He built, he, re, he restructured, rebuilt the altar. He put a trench around the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now watch verse 33. And he put the wood in order. See, they had messed up the wood, so he got that back in order. Uh, and, and he cut the bullock in pieces, laid him on the wood, and said, now, watch this now. He said, fill four barrels with water. Now, th think about this for a moment. When you want to make a sacrifice you don't want the water you want fire when you're barbecue and you don't want water you want heat you want fire you want those coals hot the charcoal hot am I right everybody everybody in agreement I, I'm sure you are now the only time you use the water is when you have finished barbecuing and you want to put the fire out. Then you call on the water. Does that sound reasonable? All right, now look what Elijah did. Elijah is getting ready to start the barbecue, the sacrifice. He asked for the water first. Bring the water now. All right? He said, fill four barrels with water, pour it on the, pour it on the sacrifice. Now, look, it would seem to me if you pour the water on the sacrifice, how are you going to get the fire to burn? But he said, pour the water on the sacrifice and on the wood. Now, in verse 34, and he said, now, don't do it just one time. Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And then he said, well, Lord, uh, no, let, let's do it the third time. So they just kept putting water on the sacrifice. That doesn't, that doesn't really make any sense, does it? But you understand now, when sometimes when you, when you uh, ha have to make a decision and you're relying upon the Lord, the Lord sometimes does mysterious things in mysterious ways to prove who he is. What we're trying to do is prove God. See, we've got to prove this. Prove that the true God is the true God. So they, they, they covered it the third time. Now, in verse 35, and the water ran around all over and about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. In other words, he had the altar almost in the middle of a swimming pool, and he had water on top of the sacrifice. Now, now students, are, are, are you with me in this whole contest? I, I'm trying to show you a concept of God to prove the true God. And we're doing it through Elijah. Now, in verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, now watch this here. When it was time for him now to offer the sacrifice, Elijah came near and said, now watch what Elijah did. He said, Lord, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and of he didn't say Jacob, but he said Israel, because Jacob is a changed man. 
the God of Israel. And he said, uh, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. Now you notice when you go back to the prophets of Baal, they were trying to do it all themselves. See, sometimes when you try to get yourself in the way of your religious belief and your system, your system of belief, the way you think and the way you feel and the way you are, you miss the boat. So now, in the case of God, Elijah gave the true God all of the credit. He said, now, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant. He didn't put himself up on a pedestal. I am your slave. I am your servant. And that I have done all these things at thy word. Now watch verse 37. He says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. In other words, you have caused them to repent from serving false gods or Baal. Now watch this in verse 38. Then, the adverb of time, then what happened? The fire of the Lord failed. Now, let me go back to verse 37. How many times did Elijah call on the true God? Just one time. Now how many times had the Baal people been calling? They called, they started in the morning, they went to midday, they went to the evening, calling on the false God. See, we got the, the, the solution to the indecision is we got to choose the true God. We got to prove the true God. So as I look at this text, the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it did what? It licked up the water and was in the trench. And when, as a matter of fact, this fire, bur this, 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 this fire burned water. See, when, when, when you got the true God, the true God can turn an impossibility into a possibility. So if you want to know whether fire will burn water, check with the true God. The true God who created water, as a matter of fact, let me give you a verse. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So God controls the water. Now, I cannot make fire burn water, but God can make fire burn water. That's the true God. And Elijah said to them in verse number 40, Take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and they slew them there. So now, let, let, let's go back here now and let's deal with the proof of God. Because we have a lot of people to say that there is not a God. Let, let me give you another passage of scripture. If you have your Bible in Psalms chapter 19. I want you to write this one down. I like this verse in Psalms chapter 19 and verse number 1. What does it say? The heavens... Now, this, you know, the, the, there are three heavens. There's the heavens where the birds fly, there's the heavens where the sun, moon, and stars are, and then there's the heaven where God is. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know, if you ever watch a bird fly, a bird's flight, you watch how when he takes off, he tucks his feet up under, up under his rear wings, it's just like an airplane, he tucks up his landing gear. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. In other words, the oceans stay where they belong. The, 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 the land stays where it is. The trees grow on the land. The fish stay in the sea. The only time that a lion comes out of the house is when man messes with the lion and brings him home for a pet. And the lion goes, grows up and tears his head off. So you've got to understand something. God has designed everything the way it ought to be. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now watch this. Now watch this. The heavens declare the glory of God. Let's, let's look at the heavens for a moment. The sun continues to rise in the east, and it sets in the west. It never misses. You have snow, ice, water, steam. It takes heat to make steam. 
It takes coldness to make ice. Water freezes at 32 degrees. It boils at 212 degrees. That doesn't change. That's fixed. Water has the same weight, roughly 8 pounds per gallon. See, what God designs, it stays as he designed it. That's what he means by the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth. If you want to know about the true God, then just look at the universe. Look at the heavens and look at the firmament, all right? Now, let me give you something else that might help you out. If you have your Bibles, right quick, just in your Bibles, turn quickly to Genesis chapter 9. Turn quickly to Genesis chapter 9. Let's go back to the first book in the Bible. I'm going to give you another way to prove God. And then we'll, we'll quickly bring this lesson to a close. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, uh, beginning with verse number 8. Now, this is the story of Noah. We all have heard the story of Noah. In verse number 8, it says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, and said, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to make a promise with you. I'm making a promise with you, and not only with you, I'm making a promise with Terry Atwater. I'm making a promise with Andre Sims. I'm making a promise with Terry McBride. I'm making a promise with Isaiah Henry. I'm making a promise with Brian Isom. I'm making a promise with President Trump. I'm making a promise with President, Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden. I'm making a promise with everybody. He said, I'm making a promise with the seed after you. Now watch verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you, I'm even making a promise with the fowls of the air, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, and from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. I'm making a covenant. Now what I'm trying to do is I want to prove to you who the true God is. He said, I'm making a covenant with you. In verse 11, now, what is to confirm the covenant? You see, when, when, a, when, a, when a covenant or a contract is made, you want it in writing. You want it documented. You want it verified. Am I right, class? Ver verification. When, when you buy a house, you get the, in the mortgage, you, you want the documentation. When you buy a car, you want the title. When you make a purchase, you get a receipt. Verification. All right? Now, in verse 10, he made those covenants. Now, look at verse number 11. Now, what's the verification? He says, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither, now watch this here. Here's the covenant. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there anymore be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, watch this. Here we are in 2020. There has never been another flood that destroys all of the earth. Write that down. Under Noah, that flood destroyed everything that walked on the face of the earth except that which was in the safe place of the ark. Now, God is saying, here's the covenant. We will never, that will never be done again by me. All right? Now, in verse 12, now God said what? This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for what? For perpetual generations. Now, I'm, I'm proving God now. Now, what is the final proof? What is the final proof? All right, let's look at verse 13. Verse 13, the final proof. He said, I do set my bow in the cloud. How many of you have seen a rainbow? Lord, have mercy. Everybody's hand ought to go up. In fact, I thought we might see one tonight in, in, in the area where we are, in the Chicago-Waukegan area. 
I set my bow, or my rainbow, in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth. Now watch this. You never see a rainbow without there being a cloud. You never see a rainbow without there being rain, and you never see a rainbow without there being a sun. The sun is shining at the same time that the rain is occurring, and then there's a cloud. That's the true God working. Remember now, Elijah poured water all over the altar. God used the boat to say that water will not destroy the earth again. Now, I know we got some people that are thinking, well, my house flooded. No, th that, that's normal. What God is saying, he will never destroy everything with a flood again. But what he is going to do, he's going to destroy it with fire. And you remember, Elijah used fire on the altar. The same fire that the water, the water licked up the fire. That fire God will use to destroy us with. But now, the proof of God, every time you see a rainbow, every time I see a rainbow, that tells me that the true God is still alive. Let me, let me talk quickly about, let me share something with you about the rainbow. You notice the rainbow, the rainbow has all those colors. Now you notice those colors in the rainbow, they never mix themselves up. They never co-mingle. In other words, they stay in their place. That's unity. Something else about the rainbow. You notice that when you look at the horizon and you see the rainbow, you see a semi-circle. A semi-circle. That means that the whole maneuvering of man is incomplete. When will it be complete? In Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 3, when you see the rainbow there in heaven, it is completely around the throne of God, a complete circle. But when you and I see it on earth, it's a semi-circle, meaning that life is not complete until we get to eternity. All right? That's proof of God. Now let's quickly close out our lesson now. I have to finish up now but with the, after those proofs of God. Now let's talk about finally. In terms of a solution to indecision, you need to serve God. You need to serve God. And th th there are two requirements here to serve God. Number one is, this is, this is, this is demanding. See, let's go back to the, to the text that we had in 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's go right back to 1 Kings chapter 18. And in verse number 39, this lesson is a little bit longer than I intended for it to be, but I think this is important to you uh, while, while we're dealing with indecision in our lives. Notice in verse number 39, when all the people saw it, when they saw that the, that, the, that the fire licked up the water that was in the trench, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. In other words, God demands that we get into an humble repentance. If you want to make good decisions, you got to choose God, prove God by what you see and what you experience, and then, but more importantly, you got to serve God with an humble repentance. Jesus said, and let's, let's bring Christ to the table right quick. Christ said, I tell you nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Christ expects repentance. God expects humble repentance. And in fact, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, you might write that one down in Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30. At the time of ignorance, God winked. In other words, there was a time when God overlooked our ignorance. But now since we are smart, intelligent, we got the complete word of God. At the time of ignorance, God winked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. All right? So this is demanded, number one. To serve God is demanded. And finally, we must have a hearty acceptance of God. We need to accept the fact that the true God is real, that the true God exists, 
that the true God lives. As long as I live, the true God is living. In fact, the true God was here before I got here. The true God will be here when I'm gone. We cannot be flippant or hesitant. We got to serve him, reverence him, and obey him. And when we do this, we'll have the solution to our indecision in our lives. This indecision about God causes indecision in all aspects of our lives. Class, I want to end with that thought. I express my appreciation for your taking the time to listen to this particular lesson. If you have any questions, again, give us a call at 847-623-9727. Let us have a word of prayer on behalf of you, me, and all those in our great nation. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you, your trueness, your awesome power, your provisions, your protection, your planning for our betterment if we only obey you. Bless those who have been in this class and bless them with a better understanding of your word. And should they have questions, encourage them to get up and come to the house of worship at 326 Julian Street. And certainly, if they have any questions, they can call in and we'll uh, certainly give them an answer. But Heavenly Father, we ask that you would not only bless those under the sound of my voice, but bless every family uh, on the face of the earth. Bless our families. That is the building block of society. Bless the governments that are around the world, that they will make decisions and rule well the people and don't dominate and dictate the people and treat all people with justice with a reasonable kindness and with a God-like and a Christ-like spirit. Forgive us for our sins. May we have the humble repentance and a hearty acceptance of your will. These blessings we ask with love and humility and all gratitude. In thy name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen for this class.